welcome back. Um, the next uh, talk is uh, Bernard here from Prekelt uh, here in Joburg. And he's going to uh, explain to us why he decided to build his own natural language understanding and machine vision cloud service. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that will be definitely part of it. Because usually when um, we say that we've been building our own, people ask why. So I, I will definitely go into that as well. Um, so I'll try and present how we approached um, having a pipeline, a entire workflow to go from um, model building all the way to a production service. The way I'll do that is I'll first give a bit of an overview of our NLU API. Uh, we've recently added some vision models in there as well. Some of our applications, including chatbots, have a, a vision aspect. And I'll present the um, service then kind of from the inside out, so starting from the models going out towards the, the service side. And um, I would just like to note, this is not an open source present, uh, project that I'm presenting. It's still a closed source project. So the focus is rather on the technologies and the uh, um, things we learned along the way. Um, maybe at some point this becomes an open source project, which would be excellent, but uh, for now it's, uh, the focus is, is not on the, the API or the specific APIs or source that we developed, but the, the general, general approach. So um, I mentioned that I'll first present a bit of an overview of what the API is. Uh, it's mainly built for uh, creating chatbots. And um, you'll see that uh, those of you who are familiar with um, NLU for chatbots will know that there's usually navigation intents involved. You want to do some information or entity extraction. Maybe you want to do some emotion or sentiment detection. And on the vision side, there's usually some visual entity extraction. If you take a photo of something, you want to help the, the user understand what it is or extract um, uh, information about the object. And um, I want to show this one DSTV example that, that um, we've been building. For example, a user might come in um, that the, the green text is from the user, right inside, standard WhatsApp interface. The user might come in and say, OK, my smart card number is this. Then the system goes to the back end, extracts some information, identifies the user, and then presents options to the user, at which point the user can, for example, say, what is my balance, and then the system responds with account detail and, and balance. That's the kind of um, interactions that, that we're building with these chatbots. Uh, does that make sense? Does everyone sounds like it? Um, so I did this. And um, now the reason why we're building our own is we really wanted some flexibility in the algorithms that we include in the system. M most of these requirements were around uh, the fact that we, want to, that we wanted to support local languages. So there, for some languages, um, they call it under underrepresented languages. There's not a lot of data. You need to use shallow algorithms. For some languages like English and Afrikaans and Zulu, there's more data, and you can use a little bit deeper models uh, and um, uh, what's called typically deep learning approaches. We also want to include some custom uh, pre-trained visual models for visual, visual entity extraction. Uh, some of the applications uh, are quite unique to, um, to the country or to our clients, and including pre-trained or at least uh, custom fine-tuned models is often uh, a requirement for us. And obviously, one of the uh, important Reasons is also that we can define our own costing model. We're not dependent on someone else's costing model. If we want to sell this um, API as a service, we can do that. If we want to use it internally for ourselves, we can do that as well uh, without having to pay some other service provider for all of the API accesses. So as I mentioned, starting on, on the inside, uh, we've heard a couple of times now during the conference that um, it's good to have a model testing pipeline, a workflow where you can kind of test your models in isolation, uh, typically where your data scientist can come in and develop models. 
and for this, uh, inside the, the service, we found it's most convenient if we have all of the notebooks, all of the unit tests, unit tests for the models in there, so that we can make that part of the entire continuous integration and, and testing pipeline. So whenever a um, model gets changed, the model's unit, te unit tests runs, and then after that, when the service goes into production or through a testing phase, all of those tests are run. And um, as I mentioned, it's in the, the same repo and also the same Python environment, which is usually quite important that you, there's no dependency uh, issues between your model building phase and your service or, or production phase. This is, um, and I, I'm still building up to the, the cloud service side, but this is really just to show a video of how a um, data scientist can typically use this system. And um, this is a typical notebook using the model. Uh, there's a couple of options. In this case, I just used the glove with the um, model. And the specific example was to kind of analyze what um, the model does specifically with numbers. And when you run the, the when you compare the, the two, you can graph them and see what happens when you have, let's say, the number 10 in one sentence and the number 100 in another sentence and, and how they compare. The exact details of, of this is not important, as I say, just to show that um, it is possible to use a, a notebook within that entire, entire framework. This is an example of a naive Bayes uh, model from the, um, the API, the framework that that uh, we built using some sklearn um, utilities from outside the framework to prepare training data. And again, you run through the model training, testing, and the analysis that you might want to do outside of the framework. And then you can print whichever test data m might be needed for the specific testing set, and you can then take that further to to improve the model. Um, same if you might want to do this in a CoLab environment where um, you might want a GPU in the cloud. You can get the source from your, your GitHub repo. Um, you can even uh, edit the source while you are busy with the notebook, because Python allows you to reload modules. So if you've edited one of the modules, you reload it and you continue with the, with the notebook. This specific example is a image classifier. And towards the end, um, I used a, um, a metric from a paper just to compare this result with the, the paper's result. So typically, the, the kind of things that, that um, our data scientist wants to do, they can do within this framework without going into another repository or um, having another uh, Python environment. And that there at the bottom is that uh, custom metric. Again, the details are not important. It's just important to note that we found it convenient to have this notebook capability within the same repository as the rest of the service. Uh, I want to do a slight detour into transfer learning. Um, we have had a couple of speakers touch upon this, so I won't go in again into a lot of detail. If anyone would like to find out more, you're welcome to, to approach me afterwards. But this is typically what a convolutional neural net looks like. On the left-hand side, there's a input piece of text, a document, and then it goes through the network, and as the network trains, it learns from the inputs, the different features in the text. So it would start out close to the inputs learning things like engram features, other uh, character-based features, and then go on to, for example, learn word engrams, so which combinations of words are good features that for, for your problem, all the way to part of speech tags, like um, verbs, nouns, um, larger structures with, within the text that, that might be important for your classification problem. And this, what they typically refer to as the fully connected head of the network, is 
what you can easily um, take off, retrain, uh, or, uh, take off, reshape, retrain for a specific problem. For example, if you had a network that can classify text into greeting, small talk, question, some list of uh, classes, you can reshape that, that front part, retrain, and now you have a, w within a, um, uh, quite a few epochs, and so not spending a lot of training effort, you have a model that can, for example, uh, do emotion detection uh, using that same pre-tained language model, but now with a reshaped head specific to your domain. And the same um, happens in the, the vision domain. Um, and I, I think, uh, I don't know if Alex is in the room, but he presented on this uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, where towards the input, you kind of, the, the, the network starts learning things like um, line features, um, color contrasts, uh, simple features, and then builds up upon that through the network to learn um, corners, uh, circular shapes, and towards the, the output side, starts assembling all of these corners into more complex objects. Uh, let's say the, the wheel of a car or um, the, the structure of a, of a person's eye. And then again, you can use this, you can retrain only that last part for your specific application domain to instead of building a vehicle classifier, you build a flower classifier, classifier or a um, product classifier. And to bring this back to the, the model code, um, this is a a PyTorch example of one of the models in the framework where um, there's some PyTorch utilities to help the data scientists. So you can, for example, say just at the top there um, that, that self.model is your pre-trained model with some fully connected layer and you then replace that layer with your new model. In this, this case, is just a, a regress source, so we want to do some um, estimate of a single value. This was for a, a quality control application. And you'll see all the familiar things. There's like the, um, the loss function, the optimizer one can choose. And then if I play this a bit, um, towards the end, you'll, you'll see the training loop. Our performance target is uh, around 10 frames per second, uh, 10 requests per second. Now, this is a, a, a mixed uh, operation requirement. So some of the models run a lot quicker. You saw that, um, maybe you saw in the notebook that Naive Bayesian classifier uh, ran about, I think, two or 300 requests per second. Some of the other models run a bit slower, but our average uh, requirement is to at least do 10 requests per second. Uh, I can, if anyone's interested in what the PyTorch code looks like, uh, I can show you that afterwards as well. So our initial idea was to build a Python module that can yet you can use from within the chatbot and from within your training software to make use of our NLU and our, our vision component. But um, uh, okay, so the, the model management and um, the consistent API is, is part of that goal. So the idea was to have that uh, Python module do the model management and uh, store the models within a DB so that you can uh, reuse some of the, the trained models. And um, as I've showed, the, the model level, uh, module level notebooks and, and unit tests were also a requirement. Um, this is what the typical API looks like, where for a NLU model, for example, you would first load your language model, uh, then you would uh, load your, your uh, training and testing data, and then diff there's different um, uh, methods and modules within the framework to do this. Uh, what we found is convenient is if you have within your software stack um, a module that loads all of the data for you. So that you don't have to go and um, search for data sets or load data sets from different places that you can, from within this one environment, load all of the data sets that, that you might need. 
and then you can go, go on to train it, um, test it, and this last call is what the typical inference call looks like. Um, and it's very much the same for vision, where you still have to load, in this case, a vision model. It's not no longer a pre-trained language model. And you can then still load uh, your training and testing data, uh, train the classifier, do some testing, and um, the, that last example is, again, what the, the inference call looks like. Um, so the, for the Python module, the, the model workflow and uh, lifecycle ma management was OK. We, it did what we wanted it to do. There were some difficulties, though, in having a Python module encapsulate all of our NLU and vision capabilities. And that was mainly around scalability of inference. So during production, if your chatbot pulls in this um, module, you're kind of limited to the processing of whatever platform the chatbot is running on or whatever um, instance the back end of that chatbot is running on. And also, we found that the, the ownership of the training data, as well as the ownership of the hyperparameters, so being able to um, manage all of that training data and hyperparameter sets per model instance, uh, with, uh, outside of, of the chatbot, would be more convenient. Uh, so of course, we then drew an architecture diagram. And I'll go into more detail on it now and um, added a, a REST API. So this first part is what I explained where your data scientist works at the top on the module level. Uh, they have unit tests there. They have all, everything they need to, to uh, do their work there. And then you have a, a Python module that encapsulates that and puts it behind a standard API. And below that, you have a multi-user environment, um, kind of the beginnings of a, a REST interface, which would give you multi-tenancy, um, take ownership of your training and testing data, as well as the hyperparameters. And um, this is what that wrapper interface looks like. Now, we don't use this. Um, in any of the products in this form. We, I'll show you now what the REST wrapper, uh, the service wrapper around this uh, looks like. But again, you see that um, you have a, a function to create your, uh, in this case, the text classifier. Uh, what's been added is this authorization token. So now you have the ability to do multi-tenancy. The models are actually namespaced also using um, a, a derived um, variable from the authorization token. So you have isolation of uh, your tenants. And still, you can add training data. You can train it. And all of this is now based on the um, model's name. So uh, the wrapper layer has taken ownership of, of the data and still, still the model. And then a typical uh, retrieve call uh, is shown at the bottom there, where you provide the model's name, the authorization token, and the text that you want, in this case, the text classifier, to, to operate on. So as I mentioned, the, the benefits of using a, a wrapper layer is um, that you have multi-tenancy. So you have, we've decided to, to use API key authentication, but you have multi-tenancy due to the namespacing. And the uh, um, training and testing data and all of your other parameters are kind of um, uh, taken care of through this uh, REST or CRUD interface. And um, this is what that part of the, the architecture looks like. We started with a Django. Uh, our version one of the REST API was Django. We then switched to a, a Swagger and Flask implementation. I'll, I'll show you a bit of, of um, the reasoning behind that. But the idea is to be able to add additional interfaces um, as we need to. If we need a, 
some core bar or similar type interface, we can add it. If we need some other weird API um, stack, we can add that as well. And I can quickly show you s the Corpus Manager that, that we built. Um, this uh, colleague of mine built. And again, it's convenient to have this, well, we found it very convenient to have this visual way of training and, and testing our models. So you can see there's an example of someone adding a duplicate to the model. So there would be some confusion that's picked up in your creation interface. And then you can inspect it and, and fix it. Um, this system is built on a Django backend and a React front end. And then, of course, you can go and delete the, the sample that, that was what caused the, the confusion. So we chose Flask. Um, we, moved from, we moved from Django to Flask because we wanted to start using a spec-driven uh, API. In, and Flask allows you, uh, sorry, connection allows you to take a Flask, uh, a Swagger spec, and at runtime, spin up a Flask server. So you don't actually go and write your Flask code. You go directly from your Swagger spec to your Flask server, which, which is quite cool. And um, this is a snippet on the right there of what a typical Swagger endpoint looks like. Um, the Swagger spec did end up being a little bit large, um, but if you uh, put in uh, like those common tags and uh, things to help you navigate that, that spec, I, I still prefer that to having to write the, the um, Flask code and reverse engineering the Swagger spec from, from Flask. Um, the way you do that is to use connection at, at runtime. So you start a connection app that encapsulates your um, Flask app from your specification. And then there's certain parameters that, that you can um, have, like you can put it into debug mode so you can inspect it a bit. Or you can add certain, um, uh, you can fill in certain variables that you've left in the Swagger spec in your Swagger spec to maybe uh, customize it a bit. Uh, one does still need to implement the controllers. You, you need to tie the, the Flask server to your own code somehow. And this is typically what it looks like, where you have that same operator that you had in your Flask specification, and you then just tie it into that wrapper code, which I, I showed you a little bit earlier, that gives you your multi-tenancy and um, user um, uh, authentication. The, the other cool thing of this is also that uh, you can use the CodeGen uh, toolchain to go and generate your Python uh, language wrappers or your JavaScript language wrappers or whatever you're using for, for this API. Um, so, and as I mentioned, the benefits are that uh, you don't have to write Flask code if you, well, we ended up writing some Flask code to um, get a little bit of performance metrics and so on from the Flask application, but for the, the, all of the endpoints, all we need to do is just connect that um, controller that's called by the connection, the, app, the Flask app uh, created by connection and link that to, to the wrapper. Uh, there's some debate, I think, still about spec-driven development versus deriving your spec from your, your endpoints that, that you created. Um, I won't ask people to vote, but I, I must say I, I prefer the, the um, spec-driven development. And um, the other cool thing was that you can add a live UI by 
just saying connection app add API and again you give it um, the swagger spec and you again have the opportunity to um, fill in some variables that you left in swagger spec to maybe customize a title or URL or something in, in the UI. And that gives you a um, UI that uh, looks like this. Uh, it looks very similar to um, the Django React uh, REST frameworks uh, UI, where you can inspect for each of the collections. You can kind of expect, uh, inspect all of the endpoints within that. And per endpoint, uh, if you authenticate it, you can start interacting with the API, filling in the parameters, and it will do the call to the service for you, but it will also give you the call request that it used ad as a, um, a feedback in this API, which you can then go and use for whatever testing purposes you, you might want to. Um, and on to monitoring. We use Prometheus plus Grafana, so the, the uh, um, uh, I just created a decorator for the wrapper functions that kind of does this Prometheus um, instrumentation and all we ended up needing was uh, the Prometheus gauge, nothing fancy. Uh, initially I wanted to try the, the histogram, uh, the Prometheus histogram, but um, ended up not using it. The, the, the first one I tried was uh, the performance of it really wasn't that great, but I probably could have done that a bit better. So if anyone has um, experience with Prometheus uh, histograms, I'd like to, to hear how you, how you did it. Uh, for example, a request latency gauge, if you want to measure the latency of a, of a request, uh, you can create the gauge, uh, Prometheus gauge, like that, where you give it some parameter that you will uh, populate when, inst when um, uh, filling in this, this metric. And that's what that looks like, where a gauge would have a set to a specific value, so it's setting it to an absolute value. And the endpoint you can then make, in this case I use the um, wrapper uh, function name, which matches the controller name in the in the spec, so you can have a nice one-to-one um, uh, -one mapping between the the gauge details and um, what's in the spec. And in Grafana, Grafana, it then looks like this: where um, I don't know who, who's using Grafana. Uh, I would imagine it's it's a couple of of people. Um, I can also recommend it. I found it works quite well, even if you um, have really complex uh, queries, uh, Grafana uh, uh, queries on your, your Prometheus. Um, it still performs relatively well. And in this case, you can see I've logged, for example, the API call counts. Uh, I think this is over, over a day period. And you can get the details of the different API keys, so the different users that um, when, when, when they're busy, um, or you can do that, for example, per endpoint, so you can see when a specific endpoint is being called more often, or um, how expensive specific endpoints are throughout the, the time period. And uh, the alerting we added to this was um, just having a health endpoint on um, the flask and the, the upper side. So the health endpoint calls all the way into the DB to see if everything is fine. And we monitor that with Pingdom. And we added a, a um, Slack webhook from the Grafana alerts. So whenever there's a problem on your Grafana, when th that alert triggers, we get a, a Slack message into our, one of our Slack channels. And of course, uh, we ran on GCP, but on whichever hosting platform you are, you can get some, some metrics from, from them as well, some uh, resource metrics and health metrics. So on the deployment side, um, we deploy Flask um, on G-Unicorn. So 
It uh, seems to be pretty stable. We haven't had any issues. Uh, it's all containerized. The um, um, stack we use at the moment is Rancher 2 on Kubernetes, with Kubernetes on GCP. Previously, we, we used uh, uh, just the Rancher, the first version of Rancher on Hitzner. And the Docker images haven't changed much. We just had to set up the, uh, from going from Docker Compose to the Kubernetes um, uh, config files. Uh, it's the DB is uh, Cloud SQL DB, and then there's an engine X load balancer, and uh, this is typically what what the setup then looks like, where you have engine X on the left on the the user side, and then you can have a couple of um, instances of the service where uh, we've about met our performance requirement of 10 requests per second. There are still a few optimizations we can do, but for um, the application we're building, so for the access pattern that, that we are supporting, this allowed us about 1.5 monthly uniques, um, which for the, for the moment is, is more than enough. And we've done some tests where we scale that up using 10 containers, which gives um, 100 requests per second, and uh, the, band, the bottleneck is definitely not the, this DB. It's a single, single DB, so there's one central DB, but the bottleneck is the, the processing on the, in, inside the container. So we can probably scale this up um, more as, as we need to. Questions? Thank you very much. Um, there, we do have time for questions uh, over here. Well, congratulations on what looks like a really clean and beautiful abstraction you've written. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, so what's, what kind of man hours are required for a project of this kind in terms of team sizes and such? Um, we started out with a, a small team size. I think the um, typical recommendation if you're starting something like this, is to have a um, small, um, full-stack team, and that's that's what what we did. So we started with a, a, just a couple of people, and it's been about I think two years now. So it, it doesn't take a lot of time. It, it's been hectic, but um, doable. Do we have more questions? Anyone? Over here? <laughs> okay, more questions. From oh, thank you. Um, so, if you, over the course of these two years, um, what were the major mistakes you made that, again, we shouldn't be making if, if you had to do it again? Well, uh, I would say we attempted to build a Python module uh, initially. That, that was a goal to encapsulate all of this within that, that module. And then we fixed it by having a REST layer, a, a multi-tenant, and what ended up being a, a REST stack around it. Um, that's definitely one. Do you have more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> uh, down here, one second. Um, hi. hi. Thank, thanks for your presentation. Um, it seems like you used Elmo as your NLP um, architecture. Of, yeah. Is there a desire to move over to BERT, or did you consider BERT? And um, we, we are looking at BERT at the moment, um, more for translations, um, but uh, that's simply one of the ones we, we want to look at. The, the models we've been focusing on up to now is models that we think would be more suited to under-resourced languages. So where there's not a lot of data, where BERT typically is a bit uh, data intensive. But we definitely want to look at it. And one more. <laughs> um, and how far are you with other um, languages that are not English? Um, mm. And where are you getting your data sources for these languages? Um, 
recently, uh, the, uh, one of the biggest data sets used to be the Bible. Uh, it doesn't have all of our local languages, but it has quite a number. Uh, recently, um, uh, there was a data set released from, I think, the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is now the biggest one, as far as I understand. And then, um, in addition to that, there's some good resources um, created by our government, under, uh, funded by the Department of uh, arts, and, arts and Culture. And you can get that through uh, Sadilar um, Center. Uh, they're kind of um, operating or um, driven by a group that sits at Northwest University. So, so there is data, there's not a lot of data, not enough to train some of these um, more modern, um, deeper models, but I think we're actually in a better position than many other countries that haven't been doing um, this type of research, uh, especially since it's been funded by the Department of uh, Arts and Culture. And when I'm here. <laughs> Hi, so I want to know if you get the, the, the texts from the Bible in Zulu, do you have to do the whole post tagging yourself? The whole? The whole? Uh, POS tagging and entity detection, oh. do you have to train the models yourself? Um, so the um, benefit of using a deeper network is that it kind of learns those feature representations itself. Okay. So it might not learn exactly what we th um, call part of speech tags, but it learns something similar. So if there's enough data, you can ask the, the network to, to learn the, the character, the word, and the, the, the word uh, structure features. If there's not enough data, then we rely on work done at universities. And there's been some, some good work done um, on stemmers and part of speech taggers for um, many of the local, local languages. Um, there's maybe time for one more question. Uh, Neil, over there. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, is this, is this something that you could actually use or that you'd recommend for building a language learning software? Um, so, like, maybe like a Zulu, like an interactive language learning mm. software like Geolingo. Yeah. Um, with Zulu lessons that you could also convert to other, and, and, and it would learn how to like convert between, yeah. like ba basically build its own lessons kind of thing for different um, languages. There's a company in the UK, I forget the name now, but I can, I can look up the name that's doing that, where they're using um, natural language understanding um, models to build um, exactly that software to help you learn African languages. Um, Sorry, I can't remember the name of the company now, but I can look it up if you... Um, okay, there might be one quick, one more quick question for anybody. <laughs> you again. Could you briefly discuss some um, what your test, uh, your test automation looks like, the, um, what technologies you used for that? Um, it's all Python unit tests. So nothing fancy, just the, the standard um, unit test that you would expect to use on any of your APIs. We use that for the models as well. So the, the model has certain um, responses it needs to give or it has certain accuracies it need, needs to achieve with that same input data. And if it passes those tests, we tend to, to trust it. Okay, Bernard, thank you very much for the talk. Pleasure.